Our second scripture lesson this morning comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 1, verses 18 through 23. We invite you to follow along with us. Now the birth of Jesus the Messiah took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph, but before they lived together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. Her husband Joseph, being a righteous man and unwilling to expose her to public disgrace, planned to dismiss her quietly. But just when he had resolved to do this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Look, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall name him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Holy God, we pray that you would speak your words to us this morning. May the words of my mouth and the meditations on all of our hearts be acceptable unto you. For you, O Lord, are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I love music. I love to sing uh, in the shower and in the car, two places where most people don't get to hear me. I love all kinds of music. You will find everything um, from opera to a little bit of rap if you look at my iPod. And I, all of my memories from growing up revolve around singing. When I was little, my dad uh, played the trumpet at church a lot, and he played the guitar. He would pull it out, and we would sing folk songs like Grandma's Feather Bed. And there was a song about an eagle and a turkey that I can't remember the title of. We would uh, camp with our church, and people would bring their guitars, and we would sing hymns around the campfire. We sang uh, all kinds of silly songs in Girl Scout troops um, up until I was in high school. And I remember standing next to my mom in church as we would sing the hymns, and she would uh, use her finger to help us follow along on the line. Some of you have probably done that for your own children. I remember especially standing next to her on Christmas Eve when we would sing Silent Night, and my mom could sing the high part, and I could never sing as high as she could sing, and I always was really jealous of that. You know, it's been said that music is a universal language, and I think that's really true. It speaks to us. That's especially true in the church. If you're anything like me, you have songs that you sing when you're happy or songs that you listen to when you're sad and you need a little pick-me-up. My current sad song is Taylor Swift's Shake It Off. I can be heard listening to that a lot these days. I have songs that I sing or listen to when I'm in need of prayer. One of my sisters and I have a favorite hymn from the Methodist hymnal that we sing to one another when we're having particularly hard days. This Advent, we have decided for our sermon series to focus on the carols of Christmas, to look at the songs that we love and get to hear this time of year, and to hear the stories behind them and what unique things they have to tell us about the Christmas story. So this week, our Christmas uh, hymn starts with O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. This is probably the oldest carol that's still sung today. The original author is unknown, but it was probably written by a monk or a priest, one who was also a scholar, because within the hymn, they show a deep knowledge of both the Old and the New Testaments. It references both. We know that originally it was written sometime before 800 and was originally written in Latin. The song had seven verses, each representing a different biblical view of what the Messiah would do when he came. And it was chanted or sung each day during the last seven days before Christmas by um, the monks and the priests. Now, for people in the Dark Ages, most of whom were illiterate and had no access to the Bible, this song was one of a few examples of the whole story, the full story and scope of how the New Testament and Old Testament views of the Messiah came together in the birth and life of Jesus. This was one of the few times that they would hear the whole thing during the church year. 
Now, while it was written in the ninth century, this song owes its worldwide fame and acceptance to a man named jo John Mason Neal. He was a scholar who spoke over 20 languages, but was deemed by leaders in the Anglican Church to be too evangelical, too progressive, and too much of a free thinker. So what did they do? They sent him away to a really tiny pastorate in the Madeira Islands off the coast of Africa, because that's what you do with preachers you're afraid of. You send them to places like West Virginia, which is where they sent me. Don't tell them I said that. Now, Neil refused, though, he refused to give up his calling, his um, um, scholarship, and his belief in God. So he went on in that tiny little parish that they put him in to establish the Sisterhood of St. Margaret. The Sisterhood of St. Margaret built an orphanage, a school for girls, and a house of refuge for prostitutes, and that was just the beginning of what he did. During his time there, Neil spent time with this hymn, translating it from Latin into English, and he put it together with a 15th century processional that they think originated in a community of French Franciscans, Franciscan nuns who lived in Portugal. French Franciscan nuns who, I know, and I see the head like, what? It makes no sense. French Franciscan nuns who lived in Portugal, and it was published in the 1850s, finally in England, where it quickly became a favorite, and we still sing it today. So this is where we begin, this first Sunday in Advent, with this Christmas hymn. The word Advent comes from the Latin word adventus, meaning coming. And our hymn starts with that same urgent anticipation. It implores God to come, O oh, come, Emmanuel. And it names the one who is anticipated, Emmanuel, God with us. The word Emmanuel is heard, of course, many times. It's heard in our New Testament passage from this morning, from the Gospel of Matthew, where the angel of Gabriel comes to Joseph. And it is in this passage, coupled with our Old Testament lesson that John read from Isaiah, that provided the inspiration of this first verse of the hymn. Now, as I said earlier, each subsequent verse speaks of another aspect of the role of Christ, and they all connect with Old Testament prophecies. So the second verse calls Jesus the rod of Jesse, quoting from Isaiah chapter 11, and states that Christ is the only one who can ultimately defeat evil. Another verse calls Jesus the day spring, bringing to mind the image of the bright and morning star from Malachi chapter 4, verse 2. And yet another verse calls him the key of David, pulling from Isaiah 22:22. 22, 22. But it's the first verse that I want us to focus on today because I think it is that verse that all of us can connect with the most. O come, O come, Emmanuel, and ransom captive Israel that mourns in lonely exile here until the Son of God appear. Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel shall come to thee, O Israel. Emmanuel is a word that we hear a lot in church during Advent. And as I said earlier, one of the places that we hear that word in Scripture is from our Matthew passage. It's a promise to Joseph of the kind of son that he would have when he married his betrothed Mary, who was already with child. However, this promise of Emmanuel is not a new word from God, that it happens only to Joseph. Reverend Dr. Bruce Birch, the former dean of Wesley Seminary in D.C., reminded all of the clergy from our conference about this recently. We, had a, we have a, a day each Advent and Lent called um, a day set apart for clergy where we go to, be, uh, to worship in our own space and to be renewed for the start of a busy season. And in our Advent day apart this year, um, Reverend Dr. Bruce Birch reminded us that this title really comes with its own family history. It's it's not just a title that they give to Jesus in the New Testament. The title of Emmanuel is an important episode in the Davidic history in the Old Testament, and it's important to remember this as we enter Advent, because the writer of the Gospel of Matthew chose to start his gospel with a genealogy and with this story about Joseph in order to remind us that Jesus is the Son of God, but also the Son of David. And it is only when we name these two together that we can understand really what the incarnation, God becoming human, is all about. That the child that is hoped for and prayed for and called for through this song will be both fully human and fully divine. 
In order to understand what all of that means, we have to, of course, connect back with the stories in the Old Testament because it is into this rich history, into this world, that Jesus is born, into a family and a people that would know and tell these stories over and over. We go all the way back to King David, the second of the most important kings of Israel, a man whose scriptures tells us was a man after God's own heart, even though he certainly didn't act that way sometimes. When David is anointed by the prophet Samuel to become king, scripture tells us that the spirit of the Lord immediately came upon him. The Hebrew word used to describe the one made king, the anointing, literally it means the anointed one, is Messiah, the same term that we use for Christ. Later in chapter 2 of Sam, in 2 Samuel chapter 2, God makes a promise to David. He says to him, your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. He promises an anointed one, a Messiah who will come, whose throne will be established forever to come directly from the line of King David. Our Old Testament text that John read for us today also references this Messiah from David's line. In it, Isaiah the prophet is reminding King Ahaz, another of Jerusalem's Davidic kings, of this promise because he is under siege by the kings of the northern kingdom of Israel and by the Aramean king of Damascus. So Isaiah comes to him and says, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Look, a young woman is with child and shall bear a son and shall name him Emmanuel, and he promises that Israel will receive freedom through him. Isaiah is reminding Ahaz and Israel that God is with us, Emmanuel, and that God will keep the promises that God made to King David, promises of redemption and salvation, promises of an enduring kingdom and of a king that will reign over it, a king that would be different than the earthly corruptible kings before him. Isaiah says this about the future king. He says, a shout, a shoot shall come out from the stump of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. The spirit of the Lord shall rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. With righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. That is the king that we wait for and call for when we sing, O come, O come, Emmanuel. So now that we understand a little about the history of the name given to Jesus, the title of Emmanuel, I think it's also important for us to realize the context in which that promise was given. And that context is exile. Isaiah was written at a time when Israel was already in exile, taken away from their homeland and everything they knew. So these promises made to King David of redemption and salvation that Isaiah reminds them of now become real. The hope they gave that a Messiah, an anointed king, would come and free them meant something different in this context than it did when originally the promise was given to King David, a man who already ruled over a kingdom. Bruce Birch described exile this way. He said it's a descriptive reality of the crisis of hope in every generation. A descriptive reality of the crisis of hope in every generation. The Jewish people were eventually allowed to send people back to Jerusalem to begin to rebuild, but most remained scattered over the world. And even those who returned to Jerusalem after the exile continued to live under oppressive power. The Babylonians, the Persians, the Greeks, and finally during Jesus' time, they lived under the oppression of the Romans. So during the time of Joseph and Mary, when the Gospel of Matthew claims this promise of a Messiah, he is claiming it for a people still in exile, living under Roman oppression. It is a time of longing for the promised Messiah. And here's how you know when you're in exile. When, as the psalmist describes, you hang up your harp and are no longer able to sing the Lord's song. So here's the other thing that Bruce Birch reminded us of. Exile is not just a historical moment for the Jewish people, and it is not just a matter of geography. Exile is any time when we despair of hope and settle for survival. 
Exile is the descriptive reality of our own advent, our own waiting for the Messiah in every generation from then to the present. We live among those who despair of hope and settle for survival. We live in a world where we are often far from God. You only have to read or watch the news to know that. We live in a time of economic uncertainty, a time of ter terrorist ideologies and conflicts, of polarized politics and population, a time of mistrust and mistreatment of the other for race or gender, for economic class. We live in a time where fears about health crises like Ebola rule our news and in some way our lives. A time when we are divided over events like Ferguson, where we are told, depending on the channel you watch, that we are either, either all racist or we are all cop haters. We live in a time where people are rioting while they shop for the best deal on Black Friday because the commercials make us feel desperate for more and more stuff to fill our empty lives and our homes. If this is not a time of exile, then what is? We should feel just as desperate for Christ to come, for the anointed one to be born, for the kingdom to be made real here in our time, as the writer of the Gospel of Matthew did. Our hearts should be crying along with the writer of our hymn, O come, O come, Emmanuel, and ransom captive Israel. The holiday season is officially upon us, friends. According to an unofficial Facebook poll that one of my friends did, the day after Thanksgiving is the first day it is socially acceptable to turn your Christmas lights on and begin listening to Christmas music. How many of you started listening to Christmas music? We listened to it on a loop all the way home from my parents' house. We are officially in the season. We are entering the four weeks of the year when people walk around humming Christmas carols, giving to charity, and paying for the person in line behind them. A time of 24-hour happy Christmas movies and Christmas music playing constantly in any place that you are. But it is not a happy time for everyone. In fact, most of us know what it's like to not be happy or joyful for one reason or another during the holiday season. Maybe for you it's because you're away from family, or maybe it's because you have to spend time with your family. Maybe someone we loved just died or is dying. Maybe we lost our job or struggle with addiction, or your heart is heavy over the news that captures us. All of us have our own personal exiles that we are in the midst of. All of us at times feel far from God, far from the cheeriness and joy of the season, and feel, as the psalmist says, that we are unable to sing the songs of Zion. But here's the good news. Emmanuel has already come. God with us is here. When Israel was in exile, when they despaired of hope and said that they could no longer sing the songs of Zion, do you know what the prophet told them to do? Sing to the Lord a new song. That was his exhortion to them. Even when they did not feel like it, even when they didn't necessarily feel the cheeriness and happy joy of the words that they were singing, he told them to sing to the Lord a new song. Because the singing reminded them of God's promise. The community of faith singing together is like memory lessons. Lessons that remind us when we were in the wilderness, God delivered. Lessons that remind us that when we are lost, Jesus finds us. Our hymn today does that for us. It knows our reality, one of exile. It knows our history, the promise of David, of Emmanuel. But it calls us to rejoice, rejoice. Emmanuel shall come to thee, O Israel. So let's together rise and sing a new song to the Lord, to the one who calls us out of exile and into freedom. Before we sing, let us pray together our prayer with one voice that you'll find in your bulletin or on the screen. Let's pray together. We know there are many songs we could sing this season, but we ask as we near the celebration of your birth that you help us to sing the song of peace that the angels sing. Help us to sing songs of repentance, preparation, and hope. Enable us to live our lives as a witness to the peace and abundant life that you offer each of us. May our celebrations point to God with us 
Emmanuel. Amen. And now let's sing our song, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. We'll sing verses 1 through 3 and 6 of hymn number 211. Thank you. 